Okay. So we'll go for a half hour, you and I. Then we'll quit. Verse four. Go. Well, verse three. I'll read it for you while you chew. Are you done eating? Right. No, not really. Well, go ahead and finish. I'll just read while you eat. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and four. And perseverance, character, <clears throat> and character, hope. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. So, patience through experience, then hope. So as we go through experience and tribulations, it creates a hope. And by tribulation, we have experience. So as we go through these pressure, we're being pressed together. So I usually ask a question right about now about oppression. Have you ever been in oppression? And I don't see you anymore. Sure. Right now. Sure, yeah. Turn off my videos because I'm chewing. Oh. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we, some people have been oppressed, uh, inflicted by war, some by childbirth, some distress, by not having enough money. Right? We all are oppressed. We all go through those times. But we perse persevere, and character is made in us. We start to have hope now. So a lot of times we don't have enough money to give. I, let me just look up 2 Corinthians 8.13. 2 Corinthians 8.13? Yeah. So you can now read it. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack. <clears throat> that there may be equality. <clears throat> Even Paul didn't have enough money at times, but he was content. And churches gave to supply his lack. So even Christ had to go through afflictions. Therefore, his followers, which are we, should not shrink back when we go through afflictions, when we go through oppression. It's just part of life. That's what creates our character. And the false teaching is that the devil now is after us, or Satan or demons or something is now coming after us. And we have to rebuke them. But really, that's what pressure is and makes us conform to the image of Christ. Let me read right. Colossians 1, 24 through 27. Colossians 1. 24 to 27. Okay. <clears throat> now, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister <clears throat> according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you. To fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden <clears throat> from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, <clears throat> the hope of glory. So, when you think about the hope of glory, which is Christ in us, which Paul articulated very well there, and you go back to 5, verse 4. <coughs> and perseverance character and character hope. So this mystery has now been revealed, Christ and the gospel. And here's the thing. 
Even the prophets were waiting for thousands of years to see Christ. They waited thousands yeah. of years. So if you're here listening to this, then you have now been privy to understanding the mystery of the world and the ages. So the world and the ages didn't get to see until Christ came. Now we are privy to see back through the ages. And I don't think we really comprehend things like that, that now, because we see it, and Christ has come, we've had it for 2,000 years, to know that before Christ, they looked forward to that for thousands of years. So what is this mystery? Who is the Christ? What is the mystery of the Christ? The mystery has been revealed. We have it. Yeah. And mystery is still there with all the lost people. They still don't know what life is about. So mystery to them. Right. Okay. So, um, so what is that mystery? Jesus Christ and the gospel. The mystery how is to, the death. How to wash yourself clean from all your sins? Yeah, the death and resurrection of Christ. Why would God create yeah. eternal life through the, res the gospel, the resurrection the suffering of the, of the Christ. So, Romans 5, 4, uh, the NIV uses the word also character. Preserves character and character hope. So this word character, 5, 4, means something put to the test and then is approved. Tested. Something is tested. Well, God makes the judgment if we pass or fail. So when we go through tribulations, it shows a testing of us. And that character is produced. And it's God who makes the judgment if we passed or we failed. Right. So what verse 3 says is that we're to be steadfast or patient. When we go through these impressions. Steadfast. Is that the perseverance? Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So how did Peter put it? Well, look at First Peter 2, 19 through 23. See what Peter said. I might be able to read that now. Okay. First Peter no, two nineteen through twenty three. Nineteen through twenty three. Okay. Where is it at? Um, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. No, no, no. First no. Peter. Oh, first Peter. That's second Peter. First Peter. 2, 19 to 23. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults? You take it, uh, you take it too patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, but was deceit, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Boy, I need to print that one out. Good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So Peter's telling us that we mature into having a resistance to pressure of bearing up under it. So a person who bears up under this pressure we're being conformed into the image of Christ. 
And we're to have patience, love, and mercy as we go through our suffering. Make sense? Um, yeah, what was mature by what? Being matured by our sufferings. By our sufferings, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, look at verse 19 also says, uh, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief. So when we bring God into view, we're really understanding God, taking God at his words, what, what he's saying here. Okay. Like, it's like, thank you, God. I'm, I'm maturing in, or, you know, I'm becoming more like you. Yeah. More, more like the image of Christ or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And we bear up underneath it. And we're, we're looking at God, how God has framed, how God has put it together, God's ways, not man's ways. So we're right. saying, okay, God, I see how you do it. So therefore, I'm going to submit myself to your way of doing it. Right. Just like Christ did. And no deceit was found in his mouth. Now, That's good stuff. Uh, verse five. Oh, verse five. I gotta go back. Here. Five five. Five five. Uh, oops, I'm on the wrong page now. <clears throat> uh, verse five. Now, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. <clears throat> okay, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Or disappoint, or another word is disgrace us, or dishonor, or put to shame. So, because the love of God is poured out like water from above into the cup, which is us. And the whole hope, our hope in Christ. In the resurrection, shed of blood does not disappoint. We put our hope in that. Because the love of God has been poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We have He, the Holy Spirit, living in us. So the love of God is wow. poured into us by the Holy Spirit. He lives in us, the Holy Spirit, and the love of God is in us because He, or the Holy Spirit, is working in us, pouring it into us like a cup. Right. And a lot of people don't believe that. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit lives in them and that God is working in them. So yeah. it's not our love to him, but God's love to us, the assurance, the security, the guarantee. There's a validity here that the Holy Spirit is proving to us it's true that we are saved. God loves us. You have been redeemed, not with corruptible seed, but by the Word of God. <clears throat> and right. I don't think a lot of people really have assurance. And they put their, their whole faith in that, and they rest in that. So like Hebrews talks about, we can rest now in what Christ has done. And a lot of people are always striving to become better and better by works. Right. Right. It's like this self-help stuff, you know? Yeah. Trying yeah. to make yourself better and better. Yeah. When, when you understand chapter 6, you don't get better and better, you're dead. Yeah, that makes you're sense. Dead by not even your members. But in the Holy Spirit, chapter 8, rule and reign. So, uh, before we get out of verse 5, let's look at Romans 11. 11 through 17. Romans 11. 11 through 17. Just a second. Oops. Just a few pages. Okay. So we're talking about Israel here who stumbled at Christ. So <clears throat> look at this concept here. Okay. I say then... Have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fa fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more 
their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke you to jealousy, those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their, <clears throat> if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the uh, first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So Paul makes it very clear that through Christ we've been grafted in. Means salvation. Paul is talking about salvation. That the Jews were broken off and we've been grafted in. So the salvation of the Gentiles is true. So Paul is saying. He made much of his ministry to the Gentiles, hoping that some Jews would get saved along the way. Provoke them to jealousy. He gives our oh. Paul the Messiah. Right? Yeah. But, but God grafted in the world. God grafted in the whole world. Now the whole world has what his chosen Israel had. Yeah. Okay. So, and so when it comes to salvation, chapter 5, and persecution and the hardness, we don't even comprehend it. Okay, 5-6. Five, 5-6. Six. Five, six. For when we were still without, without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Huh. So when we were without strength, this word without strength means impotent. Impotent. And it's the same used in the Gospel of John 5, 7. So let's, let's find out what, how lame are we. So let's look at Gospel of John 5, 7. John 5, 7. Uh, I was trying to write down a thought here. Go ahead. Okay, so without strength is impotent. Okay, John 5, 7. Do, de, do, 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 de, do. Nah, still not there. One more. Okay. Is that the right one? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in th in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps of steps down before me. So we had a lame man, a, a impotent man, right? Right. Okay. He was lying there. Been there a long time. What did Jesus say to him? Verse six. Do you want to be made well? The man said, "No, nobody's there. Put me in the in the water when the water stirred. I don't get I don't get healed." Right. He's impotent, without strength. Same thing we're talking about here. In verse six. Right. But what did Jesus right. say to him? Verse eight. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed, and walked. Okay. So. Go back to Romans 5, 6. For when we are still without strength, the impotent man couldn't walk ourselves. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We had no power to save ourselves. We couldn't even walk towards God. <clears throat> but God said, I will save you. And when you go through persecution, when you go through trials, you can walk through them. I'll give you strength to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations. So we're talking about wow. sanctification here. 
So we're following the whole concept here about being justified by faith, Christ being imputed to us, or the holiness, righteousness. So when you're going through tribulation, you're being conformed to the image of Christ. Even when you're without strength, going through tribulation, Christ will strengthen you. You'll be a potent yeah. person by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. So while we're still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. Okay. on pages. First Corinthians 2, 9. Yeah, they're all bunched up together. Okay, 9 and 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have, have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for him who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So, it has been revealed to us. We know the revelation is in Christ Jesus now. So, the mystery of Christ that was hidden for thousands of years has been revealed in Christ. There's no more mystery. The purpose for life is Christ. He redeemed us. So for the thousands of years until Christ came, it was a mystery until he came. Now for the last 2,000 years, the mystery has been revealed, and we know it. So the meaning of life is Jesus Christ? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, people that ask that, you know, it's like, what, what do you say? Jesus Christ, I, I, I tell I, to, to me... It's we're here to glorify Christ, right? Yeah. So that just yeah. Well, that's interesting. So when people say to me, "What's the meaning of life?" I tell them, "It's Jesus Christ." I said, "If you've never read about why Christ died and rose again to forgive of sins, so we have eternal life. If you've never read the Book of Enoch, how the fallen angels came and corrupted the world, you have no clue why we're here. You have no clue." Um, how we got our technology. You have no clue why women paint their eyes. Why do women put makeup on? It's because the angels taught a woman how to make herself look sexy. How do we learn about stars? How do we learn how to gain? Well, it's because the fallen angels taught us about what the stars are. How did mm -hmm. we ever get the stars of Gemini, Aquarius, Cancer, and so forth? The fallen angels taught us that stuff. Yeah. And we'd never know that unless you read the book of Enoch. So it's like, okay, so those things we're not supposed to know. And how do we know how to, to beat our plowshares into swords? The fallen angels taught us how to war, how to kill one another. Yeah. yeah. So there are things that God did not want us to know, but that the angels corrupted. So my whole thing is, when people say, what's the meaning of life? I tell them, it's Jesus Christ. If you don't understand Jesus Christ, you're not born again, you'll never understand the meaning of life. You'll never have joy, peace, patience. You'll never able be able to persevere through hard times. You'll never be able to raise your hands and glorify yourself when you get beat up or going through hard times or get sick or whatever it may be. You can't just say, well, praise God, man. I'm being conformed to the image of Christ and glory in it. Right. So, so to the non-believer, what is what is suffering? I know suffering for us is sanctification. Is it to bring us to Christ? Yep. Yeah. It's it's I'll still about Christ. It's still about Christ. Still about Either Christ. Conforming or bringing bringing it to, bringing you to Him. What do people yell out when they're drowning? Jesus. God help me! <laughs> oh yeah, they do that too. Yeah. God help me! Our freezing cold. God help me. Okay. Yeah. I ran out of gas. God help me. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. Or they'll go, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what they, you know what they say? There's no atheist in a foxhole in war. Well, that's, yeah, that's what they say. You know? Okay. Yeah. It brings, brings things to light, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So now Paul brings an analogy in verse 7. Analogy. Oh, five seven. Yep. Okay. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. So will one die for a righteous man? You know. Well, some people. There's different levels of willing to die or to give our life. What level are you willing to give your life to somebody? Hmm. You know, would you give your life for, you know, a crook? Or would you only lay your life down for your wife and your children? I mean, huh, scarcely. Okay? No analogy there, Paul says. That makes, uh, yeah. But he's saying Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Wow. It's hard to comprehend. Okay? But verse 8 now gives us the demonstration. He clears it up, verse 8. 5 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. I don't know what that was. In that while we were yet still sinners, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What did God do? He demonstrated his love toward us. Demonstrated his love. So would a guy scarcely die? What's the analogy? Well, the analogy is that Christ demonstrated. He proved it. He showed it to us, what his love is. Yeah. The gospel, it's huge. See, now, and I don't think half of the believers ever read this and understand how great the demonstration of God's love is. Because they're not going to die for somebody, not for a sinner. Would you give your life for the robber who's robbing you and just killed your wife? No, you kill the heck out of him. Mm. Robert came and killed my wife and kids. I'd blast that sucker to pieces. No. I would die for him. I wouldn't say, oh. Wait a second, your buddy wants to kill you because you didn't steal enough. So here, kill me. No way. Christ did that. Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah. I mean, what is that about? I mean, I, I still look at that and I ponder it. Why would God's love, before the foundation of the world, tell Jesus you got to die for all these wicked people? Christ said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Okay, I'll do it. And because God said, I'm going to redeem these people. And they're going to be your brothers and sisters. But you'll be the head. It's like, what? 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> you don't believe me? Look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Ephesians two. Two, two, four, three, seven. More. Verse four. Okay. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Uh, and seven. Oh, six and seven. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Wow. 
Now, while we're dead, he died for us, our trespasses. So we're talking about how can one die? Well, we just found in Romans that it was proven, it was illustrated through Christ. Now, how do we know that we are seated and raised with Christ? Well, we don't know that until we get into chapter 6 of Romans. Water baptism tells us that we died and resurrected in Christ. We're united with him, his resurrection. But unless a person has studied chapter 6 of Romans, they'll never understand what the water baptism is really about. And how were we united with him? How were we together, sit together in the heavenly places in Christ? Mm. Which we'll get to that. But I just wanted to throw that out. Okay. Five. Yeah, that's, a, that's some deep scripture right there. Now look Five. at verse 9. Five nine. Okay. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So much more. But God demonstrates his love much more than. So much more. Uh, there's a thing I found about these two words, much more. It's verses 9 and 10 put together. It's called the four teori arguments to the effect that if one thing is true, how much more must something else be true? So if God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him, for if when we are enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So much more, much more. It's a demonstration. It's an argument showing how much more we'll be saved. So even though we were hostile toward God and felt no need, we felt no need of being reconciled, Think of it. We are enemies of God. We took the position as enemies towards God. Fuck that. Jesus Christ, help me out of here, right? But he intervened in a display of pure grace of love and mercy to us. So he became the substitutionary death of Christ, which moved, removed the cause of hostility toward God, namely our sin. So our sin caused hostility toward God. We did not want to face our sin, and we had hostility toward God because of that. But Christ removed the sin which caused hostility. And now, in verse 10, he will keep us in this life and then give us eternal life. So not is he going to keep us in this life, blameless, but he's going to give us eternal life. Okay. Sorry. Right. And things down. It's okay. So we were so saying... The much more is, if this is true, then this is even more true, basically, or yep. something of that sort. Exactly. If this is true, then this is even more true. Okay. This is how it goes. So what he's saying here, this is so true, then why is this even more true? It's like, it's true, it's true, it's true. <laughs> so, not only saved in this life, but for the one to come. So, we've been saved by the wrath. So, God's wrath, who should be poured out, uh, we're going to be saved from that day of judgment. So, when that eschatology day comes in the future, we look at the book of Revelation, everybody's going to stand before the throne, we're saved from that. We're saved from that. You know, and I hear believers all the time worry about, 
I don't want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ because all my dirty laundry is going to be played before Christ. No, it's not. You're safe from that. You won't even be there. What you'll be blessed with is all the cups of cold water you gave to people, all the, all the helps. Your crown will be given to you. It's not judgment. Yeah. So We're covered, right? We're covered, man. We rejoice <laughs> in that. Yeah. So we're saved. So look at First Thessalonians one ten. First Thess one ten. I should be using my phone. It's easier to look at. Okay, 110, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. Wait, wait. And to be admired. Um, no? First Thessalonians 110. First Thessalonians. That's second. I did, <laughs> that twice today. I did that too. Um, that sounded like judgment too, though. Um and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Huh. Hmm. Huh. Wait for his son from heaven. Huh. Well, in the context, it's talking about how we turned from idols to serve the living God in verse 9. So you're mm -hmm. waiting for Christ to come. Now Christ has come to you. Oh, and we can go back. I'll just write, you, you can write down Revelation 6, 16 and 17. Revelation 6, 16 and 17, and 11, 18. 11, 18? Okay. Yep. So, so when we talk about being saved, it means we have to be saved from something. So we have to explain wrath and reconciliation from this light and this understanding. So if we don't bring in wrath and judgment, nobody can really understand what saved means. Being saved means you're being saved from something. Right. So if we don't explain the wrath of God to people, and we don't explain tribulation, the difference, tribulation is man against man, but wrath is God against man. People will never understand it. And that's what gets me. People say, you must be saved. Well, Say, boy, I'm not, I'm not swimming in, in a river today. What do I need to be saved for? You need to be saved. It doesn't make any sense. You need to be saved. But, well, you know, we just have all these terms, but we have to say from what? So we have to sit down and teach people who God is and what happened. And we don't. We just, God loves you. God loves you. Yeah. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. No, he doesn't because I had a flat tire going to work today. Sorry, I had to sneeze. My kids got the flu. Threw up over the floor. Where's God when you need him? I'm not going to serve a God like that. Okay? I mean, if we don't break down people's silly arguments and explain to them what wrath is, what the fall of mankind is, have them read uh, Enoch or something else, help them understand what happened, it doesn't make any sense to people. Yeah. How the human race was corrupted. What is Romans 1 all about? Well, not only did the angels lead us straight, but we now have rebelled against God and believe lies and make idols. Anyway. So, let me in verse, uh, let's see here, 10. 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Uh, as stated in verse 1, we have peace with God. And this is the status. This is our favor, which is the removal of our alienation from God. The love of God and the proof of Christ gives a whole passage of Scripture to us as grounds that we can rest securely in this truth. I found that verse in the, that sentence in a commentary one time, so I wrote it down. So the love of God and the proof of Christ gives the whole passage of Scripture to us as grounds that we can rest securely in this truth. So that the removal of our alienation from God, and we have peace with God now, comes through Jesus Christ. So the reconciliation is, is uh, connected to the peace with God. Exactly. Okay. Yep. In fact, if you want to end it, you can end it with verse 11. And what does it end with that? Does it make sense? Okay. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So, Rejoicing is connected to the context of being reconciled. There's now harmony between man and God through Christ. Yeah. Yeah. We rejoice in that. that. Makes sense. We're connected. We're reconciled. We now have harmony. We're not singing out of tune anymore. But see, unless we had studied these verses, we'd never know we have harmony with God. We, didn't, we wouldn't know that we're reconciled. We wouldn't know what tribulation does in our life unless we read these scriptures. We won't know what Christ died for. <clears throat> he died for sinners. Because he, And we did the four TRI. means how much more is true? This is true. How much more is this true? Is it really true that he died for sinners? Yes. And did we really bring harmony? Yes. Hmm. Can you rest in that? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk to God now? Yes. You know, does God, does God accept you the way you are? Yes. You know, I can remember when I first got saved, man. I felt I felt bad. I couldn't didn't want to pray because I felt I was I was ashamed of my past. I never wanted to pray. I didn't want to didn't want to talk to God because I felt ashamed. And then yeah. when I read these verses for the Tenth time, hundred times, I sunk in that Christ died for me. I didn't die for him. He died for me to bring me to Christ, and it was not about me anymore. And once I really understood it was not about me anymore, I went, wow, <laughs> wow, okay, God, if you did it all, then I'll just rest in that. I'll just come to you in prayer and start talking to you. Because now I have harmony for what you did. It's not about me anymore. And that just changed my whole attitude about God in life and how to pray, how to rest, how to trust, how to be at ease with myself. Right. You know, changed my whole life. And now uh, I don't have any worries. You know, and I realized in verse 6, chapter 6, yep. 12, I don't give my members to sin. Oops. Went to pick up my gun. I just knocked the whole thing over. Oh, no. We pick up some ice here. Hold on. I can cut that out if you want. Nah. I feel ashamed. Let me pick up my ice cube. It's okay. It happens. You can drop that on the floor. Now I'm going to drink it. But the illustration is. That ice cube. Put that ice cube down your pants. You'll feel like a eunuch. That's right. <laughs> it doesn't short up my computer. But my point was, here's the sin. Don't mm, you, you remember? Do you don't grab it. 
You're walking in the spirit. Chapter 8 tells us that. Chapter 6. Here's the illustration yeah. all the time. There's sins, the temptation, battles in the mind. Should I grab it? Yes, no, yes, no. Boom. And unless the person really has under, understood these chapters, they won't have peace. They won't know how to overcome. And once a person knows it, the rest of their life, they just rest. Knowing that God did it all for us. And that's where people have a hard time. They want to argue about works. They want to argue about the law. Yeah. And I tell people, okay. Because they're not at peace? Yeah. So yeah, they got to okay. do something. Yeah, that, makes, that makes sense. They don't okay, trust. Surely, surely that's, you know, surely Jesus didn't cover everything. Yeah. They don't trust in the finished work of Christ. Yep. I use that phrase all the time. What's that? Pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Do you really trust the finished work of Christ? Hold on, man. I got to move my, pick up some water here. Oh, I just shut off my monitor. You're still there? Yeah, you're still there. Can you help me keep this? No, I'm still there. Okay. I'm still there. Okay. <laughs> That was oh, well. good. That was clumsy of me. Oh, no, I'm a clumsy yeah, guy. I'm no good. God doesn't love me because I spilled my water. I'm such <laughs> oh, a come failure. on, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there you have it. Interesting, huh? I just love Yeah, it definitely is. I just love reading this stuff, man. I just... Just every time I read it, I get reassured over and over again. Every time I teach it, I go, wow, wow, wow. Oh, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who through whom we have now received, we have now received this reconciliation, this harmony with God in Christ. It's yeah. kind of like that uh, I don't know how to put it into words. There's some word and I don't know which one it was that, that means at one sets us back at one. Well, you know, King James uses this word atonement. Atonement, that's it. You're right? It means the cover in the Old Testament. It means the cover of sins in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, but in this view, it means to satisfy the righteous claims of God, the requirements. Uh, it means to put away sins once and for all. So we have been right. given this friendship with God. So the Old Testament sins are covered until the next sins, until the next sins, until the next sins. Shedding the blood by the animals, right? But the one sacrifice of Christ covered all sin. Right. And that's where most people can't they can't comprehend that. You know? Yeah. That's why chapter six is so important. How not deal with your members. The war is in your mind always. And if you can settle it in your mind and not yield your members, you got victory over your flesh. Right. You know? And that's what I tell people. If you can rejoice in the, the present privilege of reconciliation. To rejoice in the present privilege of reconciliation. Right. Then you give praise and glory to God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to see one last verse? If you want to. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31.
But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glorify in the Lord. So what happens in you, Christ Jesus? Wisdom. God. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's a good one. <laughs> so I, when I tell people, <laughs> you're saved. <laughs> You're sanctified. And chapter 5 talks about that. When you go through tribulation, you can glory in God. He's conforming to the image of Christ. What? What? No, yeah, go back and read Corinthians. Tell us right now, you're sanctified. You're redeemed. No. Crazy, huh? Crazy good. Yeah. Okay. We're done. Anything else? No.